So some quick housekeeping stuff. Um, if you have not checked in about your harvest totals uh, with Rosie, please do that. Um, even if you have nothing to report, we would appreciate just hearing that from you. Uh, it is still pretty early, so, and this is just a routine report um, that we owe to Grow Appalachia, our funder. Um, so it's no big deal if you don't have anything to report. Uh, um, I have very little uh, at this point, so it's pretty normal. Um, we are not having a workshop in July, but Rosie and I will be scheduling times to come out and do garden visits, um, hopefully with everybody. Um, grow up Appala grow Appalachia, there's some folks that are planning to come visit too, um, in which case we may try to pack in maybe seven or eight gardens um, in a single day. So uh, we may reach out about um, that also um, with some folks. And then we, our next workshop will be in August. I think the next Monday is August 2nd. So we will start talking about um, fall gardening in August. And I think, I can't remember what date our plants are coming in. Um, Rosie, maybe if you remember, or you could look it up. I think it's August 9th. August, August 9th is when they should be ready. So at some point, probably um, that week. That week, yeah. Yeah, sometime that week, we will hand out fall plants. Um, I will probably tell this to everyone when I come visit, when we come visit in July, but I like to clear out brassicas when they start getting really buggy um, in mid July. I like to give two or three weeks in the garden that are free from all brassicas. So that's broccoli, cabbage, kale, collards, that kind of stuff. Um, when they start getting really attacked by the harlequin bugs is usually the signal to me to pull them out of the garden um, and give it a few weeks with no brassicas in the garden. And that way, when you put in your fall brassicas um, in mid-August, um, then the harlequin bugs don't immediately, they aren't there to immediately move over and start eating your new plants. So I like to create a window um, where your garden is totally free of brassicas um, for a couple of weeks before putting in your um, fall plants. So just keep that in mind. Um, and I'll probably say it again in July when we come out and see you. And that's usually, July is usually when the harlequin bugs get out of control um on brassicas and you'll know and if you don't know what that means you'll you'll know it when you see it they're little black and orange bugs that attack um your brassicas and you will see them because they are ever present every year so we're going to get into uh disease control uh last month we covered pest control um these are two big topics so I, i've been splitting them up for the last few years just so we can have more time to cover each one um, just briefly, I probably should have done this at the last one, but, um, you know, why grow an organic garden? And um, a lot of people grow organically because they're concerned about chemicals on their food. Uh, but organic doesn't necessarily mean that it is free from sprays. Um, there are all sorts of organic fungicides and pesticides. They're just certified organic. Um, and organic sprays are generally less toxic than synthetic conventional sprays, but that doesn't mean that they're not, they are non-toxic, okay? So you still need to take safety precautions uh, anytime you are gonna spray anything. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get down to the spray section of this. Um, you can grow conventionally and you can grow organically without any use of sprays. Um, that may mean that you are using conventional fertilizer and that's, you know, how you're, instead of organic fertilizer, um, but you aren't otherwise spraying. So you don't have to spray in either system. Um, being conventional tends to mean that you spray more and use more toxic chemicals uh, in your garden, but organic doesn't necessarily mean spray free either. So when something is organic, it has to be derived from a natural, and that means a, not a man-made ingredient. And so this could be a mineral, based product like copper. Uh, it could be plant oils like neem or thyme oil. It could be a biological organism. There's all kind. a lot of organics and conventional sprays are made out of, um, been, out of uh, bacteria, especially uh, that have been grown in a lab and they produce some kind of effect, either a fungicide or a pesticide effect. Um, 
And conventional sprays are often made from fossil fuel byproducts like petroleum and coal ash. Both of these industries are pretty bad for the environment. Um, so by avoiding conventional sprays, you know, you're avoiding these fossil fuel byproducts. Um, and that may be one big reason that, that folks want to grow organically. So um, do you need to spray back to that? No, you don't. Um, however, East Tennessee is particularly difficult to garden in. It's not your imagination. Your friends who live maybe in New England or the Midwest or California or wherever uh, are not dealing with anywhere near the same amount of issues that we are dealing here in Northeast Tennessee um, and in the Southeast in general. It's very hot, it's humid, um, we have mild winters. Uh, so we play host to just about every garden disease and insect pest imaginable. Uh, we get both the Northern and the Southern insects here and all the diseases too. And using organic sprays or any kind of sprays can help you get more food production out of your garden. Uh, again, anytime, anytime you use a spray, you have to use it responsibly though. So prevention in organic growing is really key. Um, once a plant gets infected with something, it, there's not really any kind of cure for it. it. It The safest thing to do is just remove it and destroy it. Uh, and then possibly spray something on the plants around it so just to make sure that whatever killed that one plant isn't going to spread and um, dig into your other plants. So there are, um, in the last uh, workshop, I talked about integrated pest management and, and kind of a hierarchy of different practices. So the first part of this presentation, I'm going to talk more about cultural practices, things that you can be doing in your garden to prevent um, diseases and from from the beginning and then fungicidal sprays um, usually you start using fungicides when you at the first sign of a problem of popping up um, so some parts of the prevention are to build healthy soil um, which again i talk about in every workshop uh, creating good airflow so that means not packing your plants together too closely using trellises uh, making sure that you keep the weeds down because too many weeds block airflow um, and they crowd out your plants you really want to dial in the watering you don't want to water too much or too little um, you want to select disease resistant varieties, which lucky for you is what I spent a lot of the winter researching. Um, so I try to get us, especially on the tomatoes um, and anything in the cucurbit family, I'm always trying to find something with a good disease resistance package just so that we can get some food out of these things. Uh, making sure that your materials are clean, and this means your tools, um, it can mean your gloves, it can, you know, your boots, that kind of thing. Anything that's coming into contact with plant material, um, make sure that you're not, you know, using your, your, like, your clippers or something to cut off an infected leaf and then doing, turning around and doing some pruning on a, on a plant that's not infected, because then you're going to spread those pathogens around. Making sure you clean up your garden, especially in the fall and winter, so that you're not overwintering diseased stuff right in your garden. And then practicing crop rotation. Um, so healthy soil, again, builds healthy plants. Um, so the principles of of building healthy soil are to reduce soil disturbances. So going low or no till. So reducing tilling as much as possible. Um, soil disturbances also include stepping on your garden areas. So, um, I, you know, if you'll remember back to, to earlier workshops, I talk about creating permanent walkways and permanent planting areas, and then trying your best not to step in the, in the planting areas and because stepping causes compaction, which is a type of soil disturbance, you know, keeping your soil covered as much as possible with mulch cover crops or landscape fabric. You are using crop rotation so not growing. This is really important for disease prevention. So um, Not growing the same plants in the same spot year after year. So um, I, I hear people say, well, you know, the tomatoes grew really well here last year. I'm going to put them here again. That's a really bad idea because disease will build up in that soil in that spot for tomatoes. Um, so if you plant them in there again, you know, they may do okay the second year, but by the third or fourth year of doing that, you're really going to get a lot of disease pressure um, on tomatoes just by planting them in the same spot. So the best thing you could do is to rotate them and then understand that things in the same family. So in the tomato family, you've got potatoes, peppers, eggplants, uh, tomatillos, uh, and there's a few other things. And anything in that family, there's a high risk of 
of being susceptible to the same diseases. So making sure that none of those things follow, you know, tomatoes in that particular spot for, for at least three years. Three years is kind of the minimum. You can do longer. Um, so, you know, I, may, I make everyone do a crop plan at the beginning of the year. And hopefully, you know, even if you make changes to that crop plan that you make notes of that, so you know where everything has gone in, where you've actually planted it. Um, so in future years, you can do the crop rotation just by looking at your plan. And oftentimes, um, you know, you just you can just move rows around on your plan um, and keep them the same. So, you know, you you want to know your major crop families. So that's, you know, the nightshade family, the tomato family. Um, nightshades are tomatoes, uh, legumes, which are your beans and your peas. Uh, corn is a grass. So that's a good one because there's not very many grasses that we grow as crops. Uh, the brassicas, so that's your kale, collards, um, broccoli, cabbage, um, and then there, I use kind of a catch-all like root crop, um, carrots, beets. Now there are some brassicas that are in the root crop family. Um, so if you grow a lot of like turnips, um, you can or you can get into or radishes you can get into a little bit of trouble with the crop rotation but generally it's okay um, to just kind of group root crops as as a as a category um, lettuces greens are kind of in their own thing so just kind of so right there you know i just mentioned like five or six major families so even if you just um did those different things in different rows that would be like a six-year crop rotation just right there um, I don't want to get bogged down on that too much, but um, it's really important just to keep things in moving in di to, into different spots around your garden. That's probably one of the biggest things you can do to prevent diseases from building up in your soil, because basically that disease is living in your soil and, and it its food is that particular crop. So tomatoes diseases, you have to think about their food is the tomato plant itself. They're eating, you know, they're eating and killing the tomato plant. So you're starving them of their food and they're dying out so that in three or four years when you put tomatoes back there, you know, the disease is not living in the soil anymore because it's starved to death. So that's why crop rotation is important. Um, so keeping living roots in the soil, again, we're back to building health, healthy soils. Uh, so this means, you know, using cover crops in the winter when nothing's growing, and then using a lot of compost and composted animal manures um, can go a long way to, to adding soil organic matter um, and boosting soil health. Uh, be again, be careful with manure. I have to mention this um, because when you use manure, uh, sometimes it comes from sources that have been um, contaminated by persistent herbicides. And so this means that a farmer has sprayed their hay field uh, and that hay has then been fed to a cow or a horse or a llama, whatever. The animal has eaten that hay and this herbicide has basically passed through the digestive tract of the animal and into the manure pile. And some of these things can last for five years in the manure pile. And if you spread that on your garden, it has the potential to kill your plants. So just be careful again with manure um that you're not it, that it's not getting sprayed the, the animal food is not getting sprayed with anything um creating good airflow around your plants so you'll see uh this is not our preferred trellising method for tomatoes um however i do want to point out that they've done a really good job of pruning their tomato plants around the base i like to prune all leaves off the bottom foot of the tomato plant so that there's no leaf um, and any and even any leaf that is touching the soil. I don't want any tomato leaves touching the soil um, because that's a, a possible route route of transmission um, for diseases from the soil to get onto the leaves of the tomato plants, especially um, making sure that there's adequate spacing between plants uh, and not crowding them too closely. That's why I don't really recommend square foot gardening um, because a lot of times uh, you have to keep in mind that square foot gardening was invented in California where it is very dry um, and it is kind of the opposite here. It's very humid and moist. Um, so the spacing in square foot gardening is often uh, too close uh, for East Tennessee. Using trellises and vertical gardening can help a lot. So, so anytime you can bring a vining plant off the ground, um, you're going to create more opportunities for airflow, especially around the leaves um, of the plant. And 
airflow is going to dry off the plants because a lot of the time, especially fungal diseases, thrive in wet, moist conditions. So if you're able to keep leaves dry, then you're going to reduce the chances of a fungal disease spreading and taking over. Minimizing weeds. Um, weeds block airflow. They steal nutrients and water from the plants so they can reduce the overall vigor of the plant. And then sometimes weeds uh, especially if they're in the same family as some of your crop plants, they can be host organisms for bacteria and fungi. So minimizing weeds around your garden is really important, especially as we get into June and July. And um, also pruning out excess gro growth, like I said about pruning um, the bottom part of tomatoes, so there's lots of good airflow around the base of the plants. Can I ask a quick question before we move on? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um Actually, two questions. First of all, with the uh, moving things out around the base of the plant, um, should I uh, remove the hay that I have underneath my tomato plants at this point? No, sorry. Um, hay, uh, the, hopefully, it's, is it hay or straw? Um, straw, sorry. Great, yeah. Hay, hay can introduce seeds. Um, no, straw is good because straw is going to also reduce um, contact with the leaves and the soil. Okay. Uh, so straw is good around the, I wouldn't have it touching the plant. Um, okay. I'd make sure there's a couple inches between, you know, where the straw is and the base of the plant. Um, okay. But overall, no, straw is a, is a good thing. Um, okay. Mulching is good, yes. My next question is um, the uh, pruning the tomato plants. So I pruned up to the bottom cluster because I already have clusters of, um, of tomatoes coming out. Um, actually, I have several clusters. And so I pruned up to the bottom cluster. So you're saying go up like 12 inches. So prune leaves above the bottom cluster, even though the cluster hasn't fully developed yet. I guess, it, how tall are your plants? I think uh, the ones that I'm thinking of are around, they're in a raised bed. So um, I'm guessing they're almost three feet tall. Okay, yeah, I would prune um, the leaves and um, I would get rid of the lower suckers too. I, okay. um, I have a video on tomato suckers on our YouTube channel, um, if folks mm -hmm. don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but so basically the tomato will create in the branch of the leaf. I don't know if you can see my video, but you know, there'll be this main stem and then there's a leaf and then it'll actually produce another tomato plant, the little clones of the tomato plant. And those are called suckers. Um, and I generally leave the top suckers to just, you know, once it's trellised up there to just do whatever. I don't really, I'm not a, some people are heavy. We'll prune all the suckers off. Mm -hmm. Um, there's many, many theories of tomato growing. Um, so it's whatever you feel like doing, but I do tend to prune the lower suckers off um, and get everything off. Anything, any leaf basically that is going to droop down and touch the soil, okay. I will remove. Um, and you don't have to remove the whole leaf. If, if you can get away with just chopping off part of the leaf and leaving the rest of it, that's fine too. Um, but there are a lot of soil borne diseases that will come up from the soil onto the tomato leaf and attack the plant that way. Um, so removing any leaves touching the soil, especially on tomatoes. I'm not talking about most plants, just tomatoes here. Um, and then straw can help too, because that'll prevent, that can help prevent splashing from rainwater um, from the soil. Cause a rain, a rain droplet actually hits with a lot of force on the soil. And if it's bare soil, like in this picture, actually, um, the raindrop can actually send dirt splashing up onto the plant and that's another disease vector. So the straw plus heavy pruning um, can help help keep your tomatoes as alive as long as possible. <laughs> Poor little things. Um, it seems like everything is out there to kill tomatoes. Does that answer your question, Kitty? Yes, it does. Great. All right, um, another prevention thing is to dial in your watering. Uh, too much water will help spread disease. Again, I, um, as I mentioned, a lot of these fungal and bacterial diseases spread in wet conditions. However, too little water can stress your plants out and make them more susceptible diseases. So you really have to find that Goldilocks zone. Um, again, using mulch can prevent rain from splashing. Um, and thick mulch will also help keep the soil moist and cool, which will help prevent um, 
uh, your, your soil from drying out and prevent stress on your plants. Um, if you are using overhead watering, um, excuse me, either with a sprinkler or by hand, then it's important that you do it as early in the day as you can um, so that your leaves have time to dry out um, over the day, uh, especially so you're not going into the evening, into the cool night air, um, which is really going to help um, uh, fungal diseases spread at night. Uh, drip irrigation is absolutely your best option. It's also your most expensive option. So um, if that's something you can save up for or you can, you know, get... If, if you see someone on like Facebook marketplace or whatever, giving away, a, you know, a drip irrigation system, getting a hold of those things. Um, and, you know, we may try to do a group buy or something on irrigation stuff, um, try to make it a little cheaper. I don't know if folks are interested in that. We can, we can talk about it. Um, drip irrigation basically just puts the water right onto the soil and the roots. So um, it's also more, uh, efficient with water so you're wasting less water um, to evaporation and you're getting the water right to where it needs to go which is the plant roots um, but again it's probably gonna it's even a small um, garden system is probably going to be you know 150 dollars especially when you factor in shipping because um, there aren't really I don't know of any local companies selling true drip irrigation you may be able to get like a soaker hose or something from like Lowe's or Home Depot but that's still pretty expensive because they don't come in very long segments um, and you're probably going to need a few hundred feet of it. Uh, but if anyone's curious about drip irrigation, you can email me and I, we can talk more about it. Okay, so using disease resistant plants. Um, again, I do my very best to select varieties. Um, now, some of these really disease resistant varieties are just too expensive for us um, to afford on the kind of scale we're we're trying to provide at um but it so i i do a balance i try to my best to balance um disease resistance and affordability uh you know when we're buying for 50 families so if you do find yourself dealing with the same issue every year um you know doing some research on it um and then ut extension offers um plant tissue testing so if you don't know what is killed your plant and you can't figure out or I can't figure it out just by looking at it. Um, you know, you can, I think it's 15 or 20 bucks. You can actually get a, a plant tissue sampled and they can tell you exactly what has killed your plant, killed your plant. Um, I talk a little bit more about that at a later slide, but that'll help you pinpoint exactly what's going on. Um, and then you can try to pick resistance um, in your plants. Uh, this is especially important for tomatoes squash, cucumbers, uh, and to some extent, melons. Um, so as you can see, what you're looking for, this is just a, a, a picture from a seed catalog. In, in red, um, you can see the, they have codes. And they usually have, they should have a key somewhere in the seed, in the seed catalog um, that explains what all these are. So I think this is, I'm just guessing, early blight, fusarium wilt. And there's a, so sometimes a disease will have a couple different strains. And so this is resistant to two different kinds of fusarium wilt strains, late blight, um, probably septorial leaf spot, and then verticulum wilt. So this is a, these are actually a lot of issues that we deal with here in East Tennessee. So this Iron Lady tomato, um, it's not one of the ones we provided, but um, this would be a good, you know, disease resistant um, tomato for us. And actually, so if this one was 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 bred in North Carolina. Um, and so Cornell, Cornell University does a lot of research on organic production. So if you want to learn more about organic production, like going to Cornell Exten Extension website um, is a good resource. And then North Carolina State University does a lot of tomato breeding. Um, and so they're trying to breed tomatoes that are going to do well um, you know, in the same kind of conditions that we're going for. So finding plants that are bred in North Carolina um, would be a good bet that they're gonna do well here in East Tennessee. So keeping your materials clean, this means your tools, your hands, um, anytime you touch a diseased plant, um, you know, if you wanna bring out hand sanitizer, I'm sure we all have plenty of hand sanitizer around these days. So um, anytime you come in contact with diseased plant material, you wanna clean your hands, you wanna clean your tools, um, 
the worst thing you can do is to just go down the line of your tomato plants, pruning off diseased leaves from one plant to the next without, you know, an alcohol wipe or something on your, on your pruners. Um, so just be really conscious of that. If you have two different garden spots, you know, two different plots that are separated by, you know, more than like 50 feet, um, then your shoes actually could be a vector for diseases. Um, and then uh, tobacco, if you smoke, you really need to be careful about washing your hands. And, uh, and if there's anyone in your family that smokes, you know, making them wash their hands or use hand sanitizer become, before they come into your garden because tobacco um, is often contaminated with tobacco mosaic virus. And tobacco is actually in the tomato, the nightshade family. Um, so that virus will infect tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, and eggplants. And because it's a virus, there's no way to um, cure the problem and it will kill the plants. And the only thing you can do is pull the plants up that have been infected with it. So um, just be conscious that if you're, you're a smoker or there's people in your family who smoke, um, that's a pretty... Um, pretty big disease it's going to be on your if you smoke it's going to be on your fingers um so just be conscious of of being careful of you know cleaning your hands before you touch anything in your garden cleaning up your garden um you know you need to pull out and destroy any infected plants immediately and by destroy i just mean don't throw it in your compost um because if you throw it in your compost there's a good chance that you're just um that you know, unless you are, you have a soil, have a compost thermometer and you're really making sure, I think it's 140 degrees and it might be like, I can't remember exactly how long it needs to be held above 140 degrees um, for a certain period of time. You can look it up online, um, but that will kill pathogens in your compost pile. But if you're not doing that, if you're just throwing stuff in the compost pile and maybe you, um, sh you know, uh, shovel it and turn it over once or twice a year, it's unlikely that your compost is getting hot enough to kill pathogens. And so if you just throw this infected material into your compost and you um, shovel it a couple times and then you put that back on your garden, you're just spreading that disease back onto your garden. So um, the best thing you can do is to throw it in the trash or burn it. Um, if you have a fire pit or something, and then clean up the garden at the end of each season to remove any infected material. So don't let stuff, um, you know, hang out over the winter and into the spring and then put new plants in around it. Um, Cause then you're just, again, uh, pathogens are just kind of hanging out on that material. So, and then don't let we weeds thrive. I think I'm, I think I covered that pretty well earlier um, cause weeds can help spread disease. Crop rotation, I think I went, way into in depth on that. Um, so again, just make sure that you're rotating crops between your major families, um, nightshades, brassicas, cucurbits, legumes, um, corn, greens, uh, root vegetables too. So it's, it's pretty easy to do a crop rotation that is um, six or seven, eight years long, um, but minimum is three years. Um, so how do you identify what's organic, what's not organic? I will say there's a lot of materials like sluggo, for example. Um, sluggo, it's the same um, material in conventional, the same active ingredient in conventional and organic, um, but the organic costs more. And so if you really know what you're looking at, um, you know, it's okay to buy some conventional products. Um, you know, so long as the active ingredient is the same in both organic and conventional cases, okay? Um, sometimes there are fillers that aren't, aren't organic um, and you can run into some issues there. Uh, if you're growing on a commercial scale and you are certified organic, then you are required to only ever use certified organic products. Um, you know, you can use your own discretion, um, you know, to not just pay extra for no reason is basically what I'm saying. So, but if you do want to make sure that something is organic, um, the OMRI certified, you want to look for either the USDA organic uh, seal or the OMRI seal. Um, I think it's organic materials. I don't remember what the RI stands for, but there's a website, omri.org, um, that are a list of products that have been certified for organic use. Um, and again, you can use conventional products if the same active ingredient. Uh, 
but there may be some concern about non-active ingredients that aren't necessarily listed on the packaging um, because it's proprietary. So you, you can run into issues there. Um, but I will leave that up to you. Um, and again, preventive organic sprays, we're going to get into sprays now, um, are mostly preventative. You know, once the disease infects a plant, there's not much you could do to cure it, um, remove the you know, if you do see a plant that is succumbing to disease, the best thing you can do is just to remove it and get it out of the garden so that it's not spreading that disease to, to the rest of your crops. Um, when you, so we are getting into, so it was pretty dry for, for a few weeks and now we are getting into regular rainy weather. Um, and so this is when susceptible crops, especially tomatoes and anything in the cucurbit squash family um, is gonna start showing signs of disease. And so if you wanna stay on top of it, setting a schedule, um, spraying weekly um, or every other week um, can really help keep disease at bay. And then again, follow package directions um, for, any of your sprays. Again, they're not non-toxic. Um, please always mix at the ratio recommended on the bottle, wear protective clothing. Um, if you're gonna be spraying at face level, wear a mask or, um, or goggles um, to prevent it from getting into your eyes or breathing it in. Um, and then assume that most sprays are toxic to bees. Um, some of them aren't, but uh, just make go with that assumption. And so spray late in the evening, you know, after you've made sure that there are not, are not little critters flying around your plants. Um, spray when there's no wind because um, wind can, you know, put that spray on a plant that you didn't intend to spray. And so it can cause harm. Um, to on a, you know to beneficial insects that way and then don't dump leftover material into the environment or in a sewer grate uh, follow storage and disposal directions on the material safety data sheets which um, I believe we've emailed out to everyone so different types of sprays um, there are a couple different classes I didn't make a master list but there's mineral sp sprays and there's biological sprays or mineral there's mineral sprays, plant-based sprays, and then biological sprays. So one of the most effective fungicides is actually just copper and copper is available both conventional and organic. Um, it's very effective. It can be applied every one to two weeks um, or after we have a really hard rain. It, it Copper can build up in the soil and cause copper toxicity, however, that would be rare. Um, and one of the key things you can do is just to rotate. So using copper and then some other uh, material in, in between so that you're alternating copper and then say the serenade that we gave out. And so that will go, that will prevent um, the buildup of too much copper and it will also prevent uh, different diseases from building up resistance uh, to either spray, which um, if you over spray, you can run into the, pro run into the issue of um, resistance to that product um, in whatever disease you're, you're treating. Sulfur, um, I generally see this for sale uh, for grapes. Uh, if you use too much sulfur, you can, this is what, if your soil is too alkaline, um, you will apply sulfur to make it a little more acidic to bring it towards neutral. Um, I don't recommend that you get into sulfur, uh, but you can find it organic, organic sulfur, um, uh, again, usually for vineyard care. And then potassium bicarbonate, um, I have seen people use this to good success, especially for powdery mildew and other fungal diseases. Um, and it's less toxic or less, it's less problematic um, than even, you know, copper. Um, you're not going to run into that potential toxicity buildup. Um, it's pretty expensive though. I have not found an affordable source of potassium bicarbonate, otherwise we'd be giving it out. Um, but maybe on a small scale, if you can find, you know, a small tub or a one pound bag or something, um, and give it a try. You could alternate that with copper or with the serenade that we give out. Uh, neem oil is a mild fungicide. It's also a mild insecticide. A lot of people love using neem oil um, and it may also have benefits for plant growth. Uh, 
you can apply this every 10 to 14 days. I prefer to get a full spectrum spectrum or cold pressed oil uh, so you can really see the full effects of neem. A lot of times, uh, a lot of the neem that you can buy locally is like an extract of neem. And this is just my opinion. I don't know this for sure, but to me, it feels like they've extracted a lot of the good stuff out of it and are selling you like the waste byproduct of the neem. Um, so I like to get the full spectrum stuff off the internet uh, just so that I know that I'm getting, you know, the full benefits of, of neem oil. I've also seen thyme oil um, as a fungicide and insect mild insecticide. Uh, and it, you're supposed to uh, you can wait up to 20 days before applying it again, which sounds kind of cool. Um, I have seen it for sale online. It's pretty expensive. I'm not going to recommend it at this point um, just because of the cost. Um, biological sprays. This is what we have handed out this year. Um, they Basically, they're just different kinds of patented strains of bacteria that have been found to have some kind of beneficial effect. Uh, it's good to... And so basically, the... So the, the beneficial bacteria does have an active antifungal effect. Um, so it will kill the, the, the pathogenic fungi and bacteria that it finds on the leaves. But it also um, will call, you know, if you start early enough in the season, it will call, you know, and you spray it regularly, it will colonize the leaves um, with a layer of good bacteria. And so, um, and I, I've seen pictures and I, I probably should have found a picture of this, but basically it'll crowd out pathogens. Um, so, you know, it'll, it'll totally cover the leaves of the plants. And so the, the pathogens won't have a chance, you know, if they do land on the plant, there's nowhere for them to, they don't have access to the cells of the plant because the cell, you know, the, the leaf is totally covered with the good bacteria. So um, the serenade is, pretty non-toxic. I that's This is what we hand out to y'all um, as a fungicide. So I recommend using it fairly regularly in your garden um, early and often, basically. And then you can get a very similar effect if you make your own compost tea. Um, basically, and yet you should follow instructions on the internet and um, you basically take um, a good source of compost. So again, not that pile that you just leave alone in the back of your garden. That's not going to be um, a good source of compost for compost tea. You need a really active, um, aerated, uh, aerobic compost pile um, that's been held, you know, to that 140 um, temperature for whatever period of time is required for it. That's going to be a very live um, compost. And that so you're going to take that basically compost tea is you take a bucket and I think you use like molasses or something as a as a food source for the compost. You put your compost in there um, and then you get a an aquarium bubbler basically. So you're injecting a lot of oxygen into this and you're letting it brew uh, depending on the recipe for you know for maybe 24 or, you know, between 24 and 72 hours, you're letting this compost tea brew. And then you take that um, and you basically spray that on your garden and you're, and you've, so you've created this mix of, that's full of, of beneficial bacteria. And you're using that to um, basically colonize the leaves of your plants so that the bad bacteria um, can't get it can't get a hold on your plants. Um, I've not tried this yet. I've always been interested in it. I've just never gotten around to getting an aquarium bubbler and, you know, setting it, getting it all set up. But maybe one of these days I will try it out. Um, I hear really good things about it. Um, serenade, that's what we give out. Um, I, the web, the company that we buy this from Seven Springs Farm, um, says on their website that Serenade is being discontinued. Um, so I'm gonna have to do some research, I guess, and figure out what we're gonna give out next week, next year. Um, so I don't know if you can get this locally or not. Um, we do have a little extra left over, I believe. So if you run out and need some more, we can, we can get you a little more. Um, okay. Again, to get the most out of your sprays, and this is the same with the insecticides too. I, I suggest that you pick two types. Copper is readily available. You can buy organic copper. Um, 
at just about any garden supply store in town, um, which is why we hand out the serenade because the copper is cheap and readily available. You can buy your own. Um, and so you can alternate between the copper and the serenade and really get good coverage um, on, uh, you know, you're gonna reduce the chance of pathogens to build up immunity to any one spray and really kind of get a, get a lead on them. There is a question whether serenade is harmful to bees or not. Um, I don't think it is, but um, maybe Rosie, you can Google that really quickly um, and let us know in a second. I don't think it is, especially, and it's another thing, a lot of organic stuff, even if it is harmful while it's wet, um, is not harmful to in beneficial insects once it's dried on the plant, which is why you want to spray it in the evening. So it has a, it has, you know, eight hours to dry overnight. Um, and so by morning, um, you know, even like the spinosad, the insecticide that we hand out is harmful to bees, but once it is dry on the plants, it is not harmful to bees. Um, so, um, doing it at night, allowing things to dry, generally th it's safe for beneficial insects in the morning. Um, but yeah, Rosie. Yeah, I Googled it and it's not harmful to bees. Not harmful to bees, yeah. Yeah, it's just, a, it's a bacteria. Um, it's It's got a pretty specific purpose. So yeah, good. All right. Um, there are, so now we're gonna get talking about specific diseases um, in plants. And so there are all kinds of different vectors, um, the way that, that diseases can come into your garden. Um, and so I think, uh, I'm not gonna, okay, so I can go over these things. So um, disease vectors include infected seed and plant material. Um, a lot, most times if you're buying seed from a, from a company, um, it's been tested for, for, common diseases and is certified disease free. And so that's the benefit of buying your seed. If you are saving seed or if you are getting saved seed from a friend or something or family, yeah, um, there's a chance that it may be infected. And if you plant it um, in your garden, then you have a chance of spreading that infection um, to your garden. This actually, this has happened with to me with commercial seed. Um, it was a small seed company a small seed breeder um, that I bought uh, collards from. And then they contacted me later in the season saying that um, their seed had been contaminated by, by black rot, um, which is not great. <laughs> uh, that that will stick, in the, stick around in the soil. So I, that just meant that I basically can't plant collard or can't plant brassicas in that spot for however many years. Um, so some, sometimes, you know, even on the commercial scale, contamination of diseases in, in commercial seeds does happen. Um, generally, the companies are required to contact you and to replace your seeds. Um, and then plant material, again, um, can be a source of infection if, if, a, if a disease gets into a greenhouse or, um, you know, into the potting soil or whatever that's being used, then it can, then it can be spread around that way. Um, so just when you, you know, inspect your plants and make sure that they don't look diseased or, or, or injured in any way um, before you buy them. Insect vectors, you don't have much control over this. Um, you know, if an insect m may carry a, a virus or something in its digestive tract and when it lands on your plant and nibbles on the leaves, then it's gonna spread that virus to your plants. Um, Weed vectors, again, if a weed is in the same plant family um, as, as plants, as, as, as some of your crops in your garden, there's a chance um, that diseases can be shared that way. Um, a really common example of this is wild raspberries and wild um, blackberries can spread a lot of diseases to, um, uh, to the uh, commercial, to the domesticated, uh, raspberries and blackberries. So it's important to make sure there aren't um, wild raspberries um, near your, if you're planting your own crop um, of, of cane fruit, you don't want wild ones around because they can share disease that way. Soil-borne diseases um, are pretty pernicious and um, like in tomatoes, the fusarium and the verti verticillium wilts, however you pronounce that, um, they can stick around in the soil for like 
20 or 30 years. So once they're there, they're there. Um, and there's not much you can do about it other than practice disease, uh, crop rotation, try to keep the populations as low as possible. Airborne diseases are another big one. Again, you don't have a lot of control over that. It's just kind of floating in from, and some of these things can carry for miles. Um, a really terrible one is the late blight. Uh, we don't see it every year, um, but when we do see it, it just blows in and it can be pretty, you know, it'll kill tomatoes and, and, and potatoes, um, you know, within a day or two once it lands. So there's not much you can do, um, but again, keeping good airflow around your plants, keeping them dry um, will help prevent, you know, anything that floats in from getting a, a leg on your a leg up on your plants. And again, the human vector with your tools and your hands um, and also with the tobacco mosaic virus, um, you know, keeping in mind that that is a potential source of infection. Okay, so three types of diseases. Basically, it's the same basically with humans, viruses, bacteria, fungi. Viruses often come in through inf insects um, and inf infected plant and seed material. Bacteria really thrives in moist and humid environments, and it can come in insects, soil, wind, um, fungi need a living or decaying host in order to replicate. Um, and so they're also our biggest challenge in this region, again, because of the moisture and the humidity, um, and they can also fly in on wind and soil. So this is an incomplete list. Um, there are always new diseases that, you know, and it and can be hard to identify, um, to always identify just by looking at it, what's killing your plant. Um, so if you do have a major problem um, and you want to get a plant sample yeah, at UT. Uh-oh, somebody so needs to go on mute there. Um, it was all right. I think. Rosie, do you mind to mute whoever is? Yeah, I'm trying. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So this is again an incomplete list. It don't look like we're gonna get our meeting with the boys tonight. I can hello. Someone is no. <laughs> All right, um, downy and powdery mildews. Um, they're not related uh, and they look quite different on your plants. Um, the downy mildew is this kind of crispy, crunchy brown spots. The powdery mildew looks like what it says. It's kind of powdery looking. Um, and both, um, they affect mainly things, you know, in the cucumber and squash families, um, melons. There is a pretty serious powdery mildew that will affect basil. Um, I have purchased a um, very disease resistant variety this year for us. So hopefully the basil won't be affected. Um, these are often spread by the wind. Uh, good airflow will go a long way in preventing um, these from becoming problems. The earlier you can get a plant in and a crop in, um, the better uh, as, the, as we get into the hot and humid summer, um, the more disease pressure there's going to build up. Um, so try aiming for an earlier crop um, will help planting disease resistant varieties. Um, it, the disease resistance is not perfect. Uh, it's resistance rather than um, uh, a total proof. So the plants may still get it. They're just going to be more resilient about growing along despite it. Um, than varieties that don't have the resistance built in. Um, you know, planning on successions, you know, assuming that your squash is gonna, your summer squash is gonna die uh, fairly quickly. So having us, you know, having um, plants ready to go into the ground, uh, you know, every three or four weeks can help keep a continuous crop growing. And then row cover can help, um, although that's difficult. Um, because a lot of these are need insect pollination and so the row cover can block that and then the serenade and the potassium bicarbonate are good sprays uh, that can prevent powdering downy mildew um, from going so basically you want to you don't need to you can spray from the beginning you can spray every week um, and then or you can just keep a close eye on things and then start spraying as soon as you see the spots of disease forming on the plants Late blight on tomatoes. Um, again, um, 
this is pretty pretty instant death. Um, it can affect tomatoes. It will sometimes affect potatoes and um, other types of plants, and it will kill them pretty quickly. We don't see it every year. In fact, I've not seen it. Um, I've not had an issue with it, with late blight uh, specifically yet, knock on wood that we don't see it this year. Um, but it, it comes in the wind and there's not much you can do to prevent it. You can't, there are some varieties with um, disease resistance, but um, not a lot of them actually. And then, um, you know, if you do get hit by late blight, it's really important that you clean up stuff out of the garden and I would just burn it or trash it. I would, you know, make sure that it's not going to stick around and clean all your tools. Um, you can try to try to keep up with the serenade and the copper um, alternating weekly with those things. And that can help, you know, if it does blow in and you are spraying regularly, you know, you can hopefully kill it before it, it takes root in your plants. Septorial leaf spot. Um, I see this all the time on tomatoes. It's not particularly deadly, but if you get a huge buildup of it, um, you know, it'll prevent the leaves from photosynthesizing and that's less food going into the plant. So it can reduce your yields on your, on your plants. Um, it's particularly bad on nightshades, especially tomatoes. Um, and I guess it will impact celery too. Not that we're growing celery this year because it didn't come. Um, but again, it can slow fruit development, um, reduce your yields. It's easy to just remove, um, clip the leaves off, but again, um, wipe your your pruners in between each cut. Um, you know, if you just have an alcohol wipe with you and just keep wiping, um, that way you're not spreading it from leaf to leaf and plant to plant. Um, and then again, with the weekly preventative applications of copper and serenade. There are two different kinds of wilts, uh, especially for tomatoes, the fusarium and the verticillium. Um, they look a little different if you have a keen eye for it. Um, but basically it is what it says, your plants turn yellow and then brown and kind of look like they're wilting. So um, they are soil born. They affect a lot of different garden plants, they're, but they're different strains. So, you know, if you get a, a like a, a verticillium wilt um, in your lettuce, it's not gonna be the same pathogen it's not going to harm your tomatoes, even though there is a strain that will hurt your tomatoes and vice versa. Um, it persists, you know, for 10, 15, 20 years in your soil. Um, so just choosing if you have a really bad problem with it, you're going to have to choose varieties that are resistant to it. Um, mulch can help prevent the pathogen from traveling up the leaves, but it can also come up through the roots. Um, and if you, again, if you have a really bad issue with it, you can try solarizing the soil um, using black or clear plastic, which basically just fries your soil. Um, I would only recommend this as an absolute last resort um, that you can't grow anything uh, in that soil. And, and that's after, you know, you tried to plant resistant varieties and didn't have any success with it. So um, again, last resort to fry your soil. <laughs> uh, I, with the fusariums and the verticillium wilts, um, I, as long as you practice crop rotation, I don't think, I've not really had a bad issue with it. Um, I do see it often, especially on the lower parts of the plant, um, but usually the plants can outgrow it um, as long as they're otherwise healthy plants and in otherwise healthy soil, um, it, they're not gonna be too much of an issue. Early blight, um, this one's pretty easy to recognize. It's got this kind of bullseye pattern on the leaves. Um, so you, you can kind of tell that you have it. It's, um, it's kind of slow to develop. It's not like late blight, which will kill in a couple days. Um, if you see it the first few spots, you could try pruning them off and then spraying a fungicide. Um, and that will go a long way uh, to preventing the spread of this disease. Um, if you have resistant varieties to early blight, uh, from what I've read, you need to plant them away from non-resistant varieties because if they are too close to the non-resistant varieties, they may still get early blight, I guess. Um, again, that's you know probably a little more advanced, but I see this every year. It doesn't generally kill the plants. Um, 
it does build up on the plants if you're not spraying regularly uh, and it probably will affect yield after a while, um, but it's pretty slow. Soft rot is something that affects potatoes, like root crops, carrots, onions. Um, you can avoid it by planting a little later, um, not trying to rush in really early spring when it's cold and wet. Um, make sure that you purchase disease-free seeds and starts. Um, rotate your crops, again, add organic matter to help improve drainage in your soil. And then once a crop is ready to be harvested, don't let it just sit around in the ground. Um, make sure it gets out and gets dried off um, and stored in a, in a proper condition for it so that you're not um, spreading the soft rot. Bacterial wilt is a big one on especially cucumbers, uh, but also some squash and melons. Um, it is spread, this is something that's transmitted by uh, cucumber beetles, and there are two different kinds of cucumber beetles. There's a striped one and a spotted one, um, and you will see both of them here. And they are pretty hard to control organically. Um, and I have not had too much luck finding disease resistant plants that are resistant to bacterial wilt. Um, so I think the, the best thing you can do base is if you want, let's say cucumbers for the whole season is to just plant successions, you know, one to two times, just assume your plants are gonna die of bacterial wilt um, after a while and having, if you want more of that crop, then you're just gonna have to plant more. Um, I've heard that surround, which is a type of clay that you can spray in your plants um, will help deter the beetles because it is, I guess it, it has microscopic sharp edges um, and the, the beetles don't like stepping on um, so it can deter them. It's gonna wash off every time it rains, so you have to keep spraying it, but um, it's supposed to be effective if you can, you can find it. Um, cucumber mosaic virus. Um, so when I say mosaic viruses, um, you can kind of see what it does to the leaves and to the fruit. It kind of makes this kind of speckled pattern. Um, I think most mosaic viruses will do this to some extent to the plants that they're infecting. Um, this one, unfortunately, will affect a wide variety of plants, not just cucumbers, even though it is called cucumber mosaic virus. It is transmitted by aphids and also infected plant material. Uh, if you see this kind of modeling in your leaves, pull that plant immediately. Um, there's no cure for it. The only thing you can do is just hope that it hasn't spread already. Um, and then there are, CMV is a pretty, there's a lot of breeding being done um, in resistance to cucumber mosaic virus. So if you do find that you having a lot of problems with it, you can plant disease resistant varieties. And Fracnose, I see this one a lot in the garden too. Um, again, it, it looks a little bit like the early blight in that it has kind of a bullseye pattern to it. However, this one primarily affects the fruit instead of the leaves of the plant. Um, I see it a lot, especially when it gets really hot and humid and rainy um, in the summer. It affects all kinds of different plants. Um, I see it a lot on squash, um, but also on um, tomatoes and beans. I've seen it, peppers. Um, it is best to keep the fruit off from touching the ground. So if you can use trellising um, and mulch, that will do a long way using drip irrigation um, or you know, if you're using overhead irrigation and making sure your leaves have time to dry off. Um, if you start seeing it, try to remove the infected plants um, or the fruits. And then, you know, again, spraying serenade and copper will also help uh, keep things from being infected. So um, there are more diseases out there. This is just kind of the short list of things that I see the most of. Um, and there's definitely stuff that I'm not sure why a plant has died, um, but there's plenty of things out there. Again, the Cornell website, um, this PowerPoint is in um, the, the Google Drive, um, but if you just Google the Cornell extension, um, I think it's the Vegetable MD online website, well, has tons and tons of resources, and it's all organic. Um, again, the plant tissue sampling from ET extension. Um, if you go to plant testing Tennessee, um, you should find this link also. All right, so this is, I don't know what time it is, hopefully a slightly shorter, it is only seven o'clock, so we're doing good. So um, folks have more questions. 
we can have at it. I have a question. Yes. Um, I noticed that one or two of my tomato plants um, kind of just looked sad, you know, but I wasn't sure if that was because something's getting to them or just because we had those few days of ridiculously hot weather and maybe they needed a little bit more water. Yeah, um, I think as long as they're green and not like turning yellow or brown or looking a little crispy, um, I would let them keep going and see if they kind of perk up. Okay, and there's something that is getting into my peppers, but it's only on like maybe two of them. It's not really bothering any of the other ones around it. So I'm not sure if just they like that particular kind of pepper better than the others or what it is because I did spray the insecticide about a week ago so it's probably time um you know to do it again but I was just wondering if I need to do anything else you know to protect the the tomatoes or the peppers or yeah yeah that's what I meant yeah. um I have found that peppers generally tend to to not be impacted by a lot of disease and in insects. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I would say if you want to take a picture of it and try to send that to me, um, or if you can find a, in, if you can find an insect on it or something, um, otherwise it may just be, it may just be something they grow out of, you know, I don't know. It just depends. And I have one more question and then sure. that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, those potato plants. I've been reading some things online and I'm not sure if they're determinate or indeterminate, but you know. The tomatoes, they, is that what you said? The, the potatoes, the uh, blue Adirondack potatoes. Okay. Um, Am I supposed to be healing dirt up as the plants get taller? Um, okay, so the, it, it, I, I don't hill, um, but you do okay. want to put some, you want to put, if you don't hill, then you need to use straw, um, a thick layer of mulch over the soil. So hilling, you, you need, so the, the potatoes will kind of pop out of the soil. And if they're exposed to the sun, they will produce a mild toxin. Okay. Um, they'll turn green. When they turn green, that means they're, they're slightly toxic. So you don't want to eat those. So you want to prevent them from being exposed to sunlight, either hilling them, um, which takes a lot of work or applying a thick layer of straw around the base of the plants. Okay. 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 Um, I thought they were saying that it would produce more potatoes. That's a lie. Were, like, actually. It's, it's a, yeah. Around. That's a myth. Um, and okay. it's a pretty common myth. Um, and, but I have, um, I read this blog by a potato expert and he was like, it's total myth. That's not how potatoes actually grow. Um, so people spend a lot of time and energy hilling their potatoes, you know, a foot up in the air and it does not actually produce any more potatoes. <laughs> okay. So they're so, good as long as I yeah. keep so them save, protected from sun. Yeah. You want to protect okay. them from the sun. So hilling can do that. Um, but it's also a lot of work and straw will be just as effective. Okay. Yeah, totally. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have some questions. Curled leaves on tomatoes are usually the result of aphids. Um, maybe it could also be a water issue. If you are not seeing, you can see aphids. And if you're not seeing aphids on those leaves, um, definitely curled leaves can indicate aphids. Um, and that's a opportunity for you to go in there and try to find the aphids. If you don't see aphids, that could be a water issue um, instead um, or a nutrient issue. Um, I'll have to do a little more research on that. But um, if you do find aphids, um, you can just squish them. You can uh, spray them with water. That's pretty effective at just knocking them off the plants. Um, neem oil is pretty effective on aphids too. Um, one or two of my pepper plants have brown spots. Um, if it's just like on lower leaves um, or just on a few leaves, you can try pruning them off and see if the plant will outgrow the problem. Um, you can also, I would, I would recommend pruning and then spraying um, the serenade and just keeping an eye on them and see if they'll outgrow um, whatever the problem is. But the brown spots could be the the septoria leaf spot, um, 
which again doesn't kill the plants, but it does, it can reduce the yield. Something is gnawing, cutting my potatoes off at the ground. Um, that could be like a rabbit or I gen I don't think like cutworms cut bother potatoes. Um, so I would suspect some kind of animal is is chewing on your on your plants there, unfortunately. Um, and it can be hard to catch them in the act if you're not out there in the middle of the night <laughs> watching your plants. Um, yeah, tonight, um, definitely, uh, it's rainy, you can get out there. And um, yeah, I, I would definitely start spraying if, if that's something you're planning on doing. Um, it, we did have, at least in my part of Johnson City, we had a big thunderstorm um, roll in for a few minutes. So that's um, definitely going to encourage the, the fungal issues to come out. So starting to spray now would be a good idea. More questions? So I've read through um, the pamphlet in our book about the uh, the squash worms or the cabbage moths, right? Um, and they're such pain. And so we've tried like killing the butterflies <laughs> and we go out there and snap them with ours. Um, and, uh, and then we've tried picking them off and then they just, they keep coming. Uh, so besides covering um, and BT, and I mean, we've already companion planted. Yeah, they're um, they're pretty persistent. Um, That's why just earth won't do anything to them. I don't think it's going to bother them too much, especially with all the rain. Um, I, spinosad and BT are probably the most effective things to just alternate them, um, unless you're going to go out there every day and just squash things. Um, it's probably. I mean, if you're really vigilant about it. Um, you know, you can keep them under the control by hand, but if you want to go away on vacation or something for a week, you're, you know, they're just going to pop right back up. So, um, I spray, that's one of the few things I spray for pretty regularly is those worms. Um, you know, if you want to, uh, not eat a bunch of worms on your broccoli, then you're gonna have to, I think, spray, especially, especially the broccoli. Cause they're they're you know, it's hard to hand pick them once they've like crawled up into them. One thing you can do with that though, is if you do have an infestation of worms is to soak it in. And once you harvest it to soak it in, in cold salt water, um, mm -hmm. uh, that can be one way to, to rid the worms if you um, haven't been vigilant about killing them, so. You can do it on that on that on the harvest end of things. You know, if you pick something, if it, if they haven't eaten it already, <laughs> you can uh, soak it in salt water, um, and that'll kill that'll cause them to to float off. Is is there such a thing as is harvesting too much? Um. So the especially with the leafy greens, yes, um, because. The, you know, the leaves are providing energy to the plant. So if you over harvest the leaves, there's not enough leaves to help the plant grow. Um, so you, it's, so it's a balance between um, uh, leaving enough, enough, le enough large leaves to, to, to generate energy for the plant. Um, and once they get, once they get, I mean, at this early stage, I would be careful of that. Once they get bigger and older, um, you can probably be more vigorous about harvesting the leaves. Um, again, with like fruit and stuff, no, you, you can just pick what you want off that. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. But I have another question. Absolutely. <laughs> All of my um, arugula um, bolted. Um, yeah. I'm not too concerned about the taste. So um, do I just harvest the whole thing? Can I eat the flowers and everything? Just Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you can eat brassica flowers. They're in the brassica family. Um, some people, I don't know about arugula flowers, but definitely um, if you're like kale or collards flower, um, people will make like fritters out of the flowers. They'll just like batter them and fry them. Little flower fritters. Um, but yeah, you can eat the whole thing. Saute it or salad it whatever you want to do they're totally edible um okay question i've been hilling my potatoes but i can't figure out how much water because of the extra soil um again your garden is going to need an inch of water um so if you're not getting that from the sky then um you know you need to to apply that water um 
and uh, I've talked about this in previous presentations, how to figure out, um, but, but basically that is, I think 350 gallons for every 500 square feet of garden. Um, and that's something you have to apply every week. Um, so if you're doing it by hand, uh, that can be water that you're applying to your garden. Um, but if you have an overhead sprinkler, you can put out a rain gauge and kind of see how much water is coming in that way. Um, yeah, an inch of water. So that's, so that's, I think, two thirds of a gallon of water per, per square foot in your garden um, is an inch of water. So you can, um, I covered this very thoroughly in it. Um, yeah, get a rain gauge basically. Um, I covered this pretty thoroughly, I, I think in the first or second, I think in the second workshop, um, if you wanna go back through that recording uh, and see that, um, but uh, yeah. So it's, again, it's something like 350 gallons per, 500 square feet of garden space um but you're better off measuring that yeah with a rain gauge so, so uh i don't need to water any extra because of the hilling i guess that was my question was oh, going to no no yeah 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 totally more same. water than what yeah. i normally would no nope, same amount of water totally okay. yeah yeah sorry um okay yeah when you pick kale, lettuce, basil, um, should you pick all over the plant or the bottom or the top doesn't matter so the most important thing is that you don't pick the, especially with kale, um, that you don't pick the very center of the plant because that's the growing part of the plant. So if you pick off the growing part of the kale, then the plant's gonna stop growing. Uh, it may produce side shoots, but they're not gonna be as big. Um, so I generally start from the bottom of the plant and pick off those leaves that way um, and leave, you know, especially on the smaller plants, leave enough bigger leaves so that it keeps producing more energy for the plant. Um, oh, did I, okay, I'll go back and find a question. Um, so lettuce, um, you have the option um, in the cooler months, I like to pick off leaves um, from the side and just let the, keep, let the plant keep growing. However, with lettuce, when it gets hot outside, lettuce tends to bolt really quickly. So that means it goes to flower. Um, and lettuce especially becomes pretty bitter um, when it starts to flower. So a lot of people don't like the flavor. Um, you may enjoy it, but um, either way, the leaves become less edible basically when it starts, when lettuce starts to flower. So in, when it gets, when lettuce is ready to pick in the summer, in the, in the hot weather, then you need to pick it. Um, you don't need to let it, don't let it sit out in the hot weather. And basil, um, I pick all over with basil and the more you you do want to pick the growing tips of basil um, because that will force the plant to become bushier and, and you do want bushiness in basil. You don't want bushiness in kale. Um, so this is, I guess, a more complicated question than maybe you thought. So it, I guess the answer is it depends on the plant. Um, but yes, basil, you want to pick off um, the growing tips and that'll force more bushiness and bushiness will be mean more basil for you. Um, so if you have more specific questions about um, what a plant looks like when it's ready to harvest um, or harvesting questions on anything, you could just email me or if you want to send a picture of something um, and ask me, that can be a great way. Um, I, oh, when should, ca okay, I see the question I missed. When should cabbages begin to form a head? Um, mine seem to be growing taller but not forming a head. Uh, I can look up, um, Rosie, can you look up the varieties that we picked out and see how long they take to, to get ready to harvest? I can't yeah. remember off the top of my head. I don't think they're particularly long-term cabbages, but, um, um, but some cabbages are really fast, you know, so they might have a 60 day growth period and other cabbages might have an 80 or a 90 day growth period. So it just depends on the variety. Um, you can eat the leaves too. Um, and it may be that they don't like the heat, um, the way it got really hot, really fast. It went from kind of cold to like really hot um, all at once. And sometimes brassicas um, don't do well in those kind of conditions. Um, so, I don't know, they may just try to flower and not form a head at all. And that's unfortunate, but you can totally eat the leaves of cabbage, of 
you can eat broccoli leaves too. I'm, I, I eat a lot of broccoli leaves um, while I'm waiting for them to form heads. Um, so you can just chop them up like you would kale or collards um, and eat them that way. Okay. Uh, can we start eating our kale at any point? Yeah, you can, you can eat it now. I'm definitely out there eating a lot of kale. Um, any other questions? The cabbage is about 65 days. 65 days. So um, I would expect that to start heading. And if it's not heading now, um, it may just be that it doesn't like the weather. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm sorry. Um, you, I would let it sit out and give it another month or so. And if it still isn't doing anything, you can just probably just rip it up and try again next time. Unfortunately, when it gets really hot like this, um, brassicas especially tend to be unhappy. And sometimes the, cause it got cold, um, like what was it two weeks ago, it got really cold. Um, and so sometimes that warm, cold, warm again, will actually trigger flowering in brassicas. They're, they're biennial plants. So they normally grow for the first year and then flower in the second year. Um, but it's that kind of cold winter period that triggers that flowering. So if we have weather that, that switches around too much um, in the spring, then yeah, that can just, that can tell them to, to flower instead of form heads. Um, are there any crops that should not be covered with mulch and straw? Um, I tend to mulch almost everything. Um, I guess with like smaller seeded crops like carrots, it can be hard to get mulch in there. Um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try <laughs> once they've germinated and they've grown to a pretty decent size. Um, you can get some mulch in there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of mulching. I think it's one of the best things you can do. Yeah, my, your last attempt with cabbage, it, it can be hard. Um, this is a pretty resilient variety that we've picked out. It generally does pretty well, but sometimes the weather just kind of makes things wonky and and the plant just, just yeah, it doesn't form a head. Yeah. Can I ask um, a question? Yep. Um, so my peas just, they're like maybe about a foot tall and they aren't, they haven't grown at all this week. Um, probably just because it's like so hot and stuff now. So would it be worth it to just take those out and plant the summer stuff that I was going to plant in place of them since it's probably too hot now for them to eventually produce? I don't know. Um, I'd let, I'd let it go for another couple weeks. Um, mine has been flowering pretty well and, and producing, um, peas. Okay. Um, so I'd let it see. I'd I'd give it another couple of weeks, um, or another, at least another week or two, uh, and just see. Okay. I'd hate for you to miss sweet peas. I know they're my favorite. <laughs> so I'm like, grow, grow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, see, so yeah, see what it does. They may maybe um be, give them extra water and see if that helps um inspire them to flower. Okay. Uh, this is a pretty. It's a pretty good disease resistant variety and it it also does well in the fall which tends to be warmer anyway so i don't know i'd, I'd give it a minute um after the grow time of carrots no leave your carrots there i don't know why they give you grow times on carrots they take forever plan plan for like three extra months on your carrots <laughs> you might not pick them until the fall um just let them hang out they uh they will take a while yeah. Um, and carrots will hang out. I mean, if they aren't, if you get to the fall and they still haven't gotten very big, you can leave them over the winter and see if they'll grow a little more. They'll generally survive the cold weather. Um, and they may, you may actually get a harvest in the early spring with carrots. They could take a while. Some people have better luck with carrots than others. I've, I've, uh, some gardeners, um, will, you know, their carrots will be like a foot long and like two inches wide and other people don't get any carrots at all. All right. Um, any other questions?
All right. I thank think, you. Yeah, I think we can head out.